Good morning and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 13th of January and this quick look at the week ahead beginning 16th of January with me Michael Hewson. Um, it's been another positive week for European equity markets as well as US equity markets and it's largely driven by a combination of factors really. The strong start appears to be a result of a combination of falling prices, warmer weather uh, and better than expected trading statements from a host of companies after the widespread pessimism that characterised an awful lot of the narrative in the lead up to Christmas. Of course, challenges still remain, um, not least what happens to commodity prices as the Chinese economy reopens. But at the moment, we have the FTSE 100 um, above 7,800 for the first time since 2018 with the potential that we could well retest the all-time highs at 7,900. Um, I'm certainly optimistic that the FTSE 100 can take out those highs and head towards 8,000 in the coming weeks and months. And certainly, I think on a total return basis, the FTSE 100 is already at record highs. The DAX, on the other hand, which is a total return index, has also been doing very well over the course of the past few days. In fact, since the start of the year, it's up over 8%, having broken above the November highs at the start of this year. So, I mean, there is certainly potential for us to go an awful lot higher if we look at the downtrend line from the highs from January last year. We pretty much, we haven't quite got to close to reversing all of them, but we're certainly well on the way. And we can certainly argue that perhaps some of this rebound is being driven by um, certainly a glass is half full rather than a glass is half empty um, approach to sentiment. Obviously, the US CPI numbers this week um, came in in line with expectations with core CPI dropping below 6% for, for the first time since December 2021. Um, and I think uh, reinforcing an expectation perhaps that um, the Federal Reserve will go for another um, pairing down in the pace of its rate hiking cycle to 0.25%. But I can't help feeling that the market is getting a little bit ahead of itself because certainly, yes, in energy prices have fallen. The big, the big drop in inflation this week was largely driven by energy prices. But as we can see from UK CPI, um, that is that is still in double digits and um, could well fall further next week when we get the latest UK CPI numbers. Um, but more broadly, um, while we have seen a lower energy prices in a warmer winter, Chinese demand is likely to keep a floor under those and could actually, if Goldman Sachs is right, see crude oil prices move back to $110 a barrel. So there's certainly an awful lot of good reasons to be optimistic. But there's certainly also an awful lot of good reasons to be cautious in the short to medium term. But certainly, I think on the basis of what we've seen so far this year, I'm probably more optimistic about European markets than I am about US markets. Certainly, I think there's an awful lot more scope for European and UK markets to move higher. So, you know, basically looking at it through that lens, when you've got interest rates which are at much more normalized levels, then ultimately you have to look at what generates a return for your money. And ultimately, while US markets have outperformed over the course of the past 10 or 15 years, that hasn't been the case for markets here in Europe or the UK. So that gives us the potential, I think, for slightly more upside perhaps than say there is in US markets, which still remain very much in the downtrend that they've been in for the past 12 months. If we look at a FTSE 100, we can see here that the next target is all the way back here in May 2018. But certainly, I think there is there is potential for us to go quite a bit higher simply on the basis of valuations and some of the some of the decent gains that we've seen so far um, this week. I mean, the FTSE 100 is up over four and a half percent this 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 year alone, and a large part of that has been driven by big rebounds in retail stocks um, like JD Sports, but as house builders as well, as um, as interest rates and mortgage rates have come down. Um, but 
as far as US markets are concerned, nothing has changed. Yes, we've seen a decent rebound over the course of the past few days, but we are still very much in the downtrend that we've been in since the peaks of last year. And that for more that that really I think keeps me slightly more cautious about the prospects for US markets than it does say, for example, for markets in Europe. We're seeing a significant divergence when it comes to market performance um, and have been seeing a significant divergence pretty much since the lows all the way back in October. While markets in Europe have rallied strongly, that certainly hasn't been the case for US markets. And that, I think, for me, keeps the focus very much, as far as US markets are concerned, on a sell of the rally mentality. The dollar continues to remain weak. Dollar yen is going to be a particular focus of my attention um, this week. Uh, as well as obviously the Japanese stock market. If we look at dollar yen, we've broken below 129.50 and the previous lows. And with the Bank of Japan coming up this coming week, um, all eyes will be on policymakers there in the light of the tweak to yield curve control that we saw at the last meeting. Certainly, I think the markets are front running a significant change in monetary policy. Um, from the Bank of Japan. Of course, I don't think they'll get it, but certainly I think there is potential for it to happen over the course of the next few months. And that suggests to me that we are going to see further weakness in dollar yen. Um, we will probably see a test of this 50% Fibonacci retracement level from the lows that we saw back in 2020 to the peaks of um, last year. So certainly I think as a minimum we're going to see a test of this trend line and a test of this 50% level of 126 and a half over the course of the next few days. Certainly I think there's a big cap at around 134.80. We saw that with these two peaks here on the 28th of December but also this peak through here that we saw in the early part of last week. Certainly weaker dollar remains the underlying narrative. Um, certainly ahead of the Fed meeting on the on the 30th of Jan and the 1st of February. There does appear to be splits starting to open up now amongst Fed policymakers. Um, those who want to get to um, the 5% or an above 5% sooner rather than later. You've had James Bullard of the St. Louis Fed arguing for that very fact uh, in the aftermath of the CPI report earlier this week. So you want to get to 5% as soon as possible, front loading um, with the Fed funds rate at 4.5%. Um, that suggests that he would want a 50 basis point rate hike when the Fed meets um, at the beginning of February. But then you've got Patrick Harker um, of the Philadelphia Fed and Thomas Barkin of the Richmond Fed who are suggesting that a step down, another step down to 25 basis points might be appropriate. So certainly I think um, there are divisions opening up, not in terms of hiking rates, but in terms of the scale of the hike that we're likely to see. We could also see a 25 basis point hawkish hike. Ultimately, the markets are front running a Fed pivot at some point. I still think that is probably unlikely at this case in point. Markets are pricing in a right cut in the fourth quarter of this year. Time will tell whether or not that's a realistic proposition. But given the fact that core prices are still at 6% and um, the, the headline rate or the, or the Fed's target rate is 2%, we still have some way to go. Certainly in respect to euro dollar, um, we have start, we've starting to see a move higher. Um, the break of 107.80 does, has the potential to target further gains towards 109.40, 109.50. Um, ECB policymakers have been arguing for another 50 basis point rate hike in February, in early February. So we'll see whether or not on the 2nd of February, we'll see whether or not that transpires. Um, certainly, there are also divisions on the governing council when it comes to um, whether or not we get 50 um, or whether we get another 350s or another 250s between now and the end of Q1. So there's certainly... Um, room for significant splits. And then, of course, we've got the Bank of England. We're also meeting on the 2nd of February. And the recent GDP numbers that saw the UK economy um, actually expand modestly in November by 0.1%. Um, 
and a large part of the reason for that um, slightly better than expected number was the services sector, which saw um, spending as a consequence of the World Cup, which started in Qatar on the 20th of November. We also saw additional spend um, as a result of um, um, travel and leisure. And given some of the retail updates that we've seen this week, um, we could well see a positive month in terms of services for December as well. People have talked about the negative effect of strikes and um, in Royal Mail and um, and um, and the railways. But ultimately, I think what what this week's retail numbers have told us is that all that's done is displace retail activity um, in the likes of Marks and Spencers instead of people asking or um, uh, ordering stuff online, they've gone and collected it. Um, and I think that's probably going to have been the same for an awful lot of high street retailers rather than people ordering stuff online and having it delivered. They've used or they've made more use of click and collect. So that could well not be as negative as perhaps that we might have suggested it might be um, in the lead up to Christmas. So certainly I think there is a perception that maybe the glass is half full as opposed to being half empty. And earnings, by and large, have been better than expected. Now we're starting to get into the guts of earnings season. And um, certainly some of the numbers that we're seeing come out have been good. Obviously, some there, there has been some room for disappointment. But ultimately, we've got, um, we've got bank earnings starting today. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not we see these US banks start to set aside higher provisions for non-performing loans as the as the US economy heads into the back end of 2022. More importantly, I think as we look ahead, um, we're going to, I'm going to start looking at Netflix, for example. Their numbers are due out um, next week and the share price there has been has seen a fairly decent rebound over the course of the past few months as we get to see the first indications of how their new ad tier has done. In Q3, paid memberships rebounded by 2.41 million, which was well above expectations of 1 million, which pushed total subscribers to a new record high of 200, just over 223 million. Now, they expect this number to rise by 4.5 million in this fourth quarter um, to 227.59 million. And um, it'll be interesting to see whether or not uh, Q4 revenues um, actually come in in line with expectations. They are they are expected to moderate slightly from the 7.85 billion that we saw, sorry, the 7.93 billion that we saw in Q3, expecting a slightly sl slightly slower rate of revenue at 7.78 billion dollars. Net income is expected to fall quite sharply to 163 million dollars or 36 cents a share but q4 always tends to be the weaker quarter because generally that's when all the content costs get loaded into the end of the year operating margin is also expected to fall to 4.2 percent down from 8.2 percent a year ago netflix is um blaming the strength of the us dollar for the headwinds with respect to its q4 expectations but i think that's smoke and mirrors because the strong dollar has been a symptom of uh, the numbers for Q1, Q2 and Q3 and actually in Q4 the dollar has actually come off, um, not gone up. So it's basically down from its peaks. From the tone of the shareholder letter that we saw in Q3, it's clear that Netflix doesn't expect a material contribution from the new ads tier in Q4, which started on November the 3rd. And recent indications do suggest it has got off to a slow start with um, Netflix actually returning some ad revenue to advertisers um, due to a um, due, due, to, due to low take up. So I think company, one of the things that um, what we did pay particular attention to for 2023, Netflix has said it's no longer going to be publishing guidance of subscriber numbers and that they wanted investors to focus on the key metrics of revenue, operating margin, operating margin, operating income and net income. So certainly we've got significant resistance at these highs here from December and January, filled the gap here 
this big gap here. So the big question is, can we not only fill the gap, but also push up through $350? So it's going to be a big week for Tesla. Uh, the big question is, is whether or not all the good news is already priced in. Goldman Sachs, similarly, um, we've seen a fairly decent rebound over the course of the past few weeks. That rebound does appear to be running out of steam. Goldman Sachs has already announced that it's going to be cutting headcount um, and we could get further detail on that in Monday's numbers. Um, furthermore, I think there's certainly an even chance that um, profits could well come in lower um, as a result of the reduction in headcount and, um, um, and, and potentially as well, I think um, the fact that um, they probably haven't leveraged the um, improvements that we've seen when it comes to um, the improvements in net interest margin. So I think the big level on Goldman Sachs is $390. Big question is whether or not we get enough from the trading statement on Monday to signal whether or not we can see a retest of these highs or whether we drift back to the lows that we saw in the uh, early part of this month. Got Ocado Group as well. Um, seen a very solid rebound in Ocado shares over the course of the past um, few days. We haven't quite matched the big bump that we saw as a result of the deal that they announced back in November with uh, Korea's um, lot shopping, which saw these sh shares surge to their highest levels since August. But certainly, I think since those October lows, we have seen a, a little bit of a rebound. And we are now starting to see a little bit of a push higher as well. But it's interesting to note that that November spike didn't take out the 200-day two, moving average, um, which has, over the course of the past um, two years, managed to contain every single move into it um, since then. So I think this week's numbers are likely to take us a key test. Can we break above the 200-day moving average and test the peaks that we saw all the way back in last summer and which was capped by the spike higher in November. 200 day moving average, keep an eye on that. It's gonna be a very interesting week when it comes to Ocado shares. In terms of the fundamentals that we've got out this week, we've got UK CPI. Are we gonna see a further softening there? Fell back to 10.7% in November. Obviously um, oil prices have fallen back and for those eagle eyed of you, will have noticed that pump prices have also fallen back below £1.50 a litre. Um, the big question is whether or not that is going to be sustained going forward. Certainly, we've seen a decent rebound in Brent prices over the course of the past week or so after a very poor start to the year um, in the opening start. But we do appear to be slowly recovering an awful lot of those losses. are still down on the year. The big question is, whether or not we continue to go higher. Certainly the expectation is that we will. But if we look at a daily chart, we still are very much in the downtrend that we've been in pretty much since June. So um, we could well see a retest back to around about $90 a barrel. The big question is whether or not that rebuffs this particular rally and we drift back lower again. Still an awful lot of water to go under that particular bridge. So I'm certainly not calling for higher oil prices quite yet. We've also got UK wages, UK unemployment data on the 17th. We've got UK retail sales on the Friday. Judging by those retail updates, we could see a positive surprise there. So I'll be paying particular attention to that. And we've also got China's fourth quarter GDP numbers, China's retail sales numbers. It'll be very surprising indeed if China's economy doesn't drop into contraction territory when those numbers are released um, later this week. We already know October retail sales in China fell by 0.5%. It's followed by a 5.9% decline in November. This week's retail sales numbers for December are forecast to see a 8.3% decline. And there is a distinct possibility that we could well see the Chinese economy contract by 0.8% when those numbers are released later this week. We've also got US retail sales coming out as well. So a huge week for data, a huge week for earnings, but ultimately, while we've got off to a very positive start when it comes to um, European equity markets, and I certainly think there's much uh, there's there's room for improvement there. 
US markets still remain very much in a downtrend. And that's not particularly hard to explain when you actually consider that on a yield basis, um, the forward dividend yield for the FTSE 100 and the DAX is very much in the three and a half, four percent percentile, whereas for in the US S&P 500 NASDAQ, it's yielding at around about one um, percent. So, you know, why invest in US markets, um, US stocks, when you can buy US treasuries and get a coupon of around about four percent or invest in European and UK stocks and you can get a dividend yield, an average dividend yield of four, four and a half, three, four, four and a half, five percent. So interesting few couple of weeks coming up. That's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening. This is Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Markets.